the city of St. Louis, you're listening to the Don't Push Pause podcast with your hosts, Justin Johnson and Lindsay Reber. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Justin. What's up, Lindsay? This is one of my favorite movies. We are going doing uh, Casino, and also at um, uh, the casino that's being talked about in this movie later turned into, or were they filmed? The, tang- they filmed the Tangiers yeah. that takes place is a fake, you know, is made up. But where they shot what doubled as the Tangiers mm-hmm. Hotel and Casino was the Riviera Hotel, which is where I got married. It's pretty special. On Scorsese's birthday. Coincidence? I don't know. Really, things feel... It's weird. Like they're just falling into place here. Did you ever go back there for an anniversary? I did. Okay. For, for our fifth anniversary, we went oh. back there. But two years ago, uh, they they demolished it. Oh. Just like they do the hotels at the end of the movie. They yeah. exploded it and tore it down. And I don't know what's in its place now, but it was actually one of the last few... Um, old hotels from that era of when Casino took place. I feel like I visited, I'm pretty sure, I, th- I know that's not where I stayed the one time that I went to Vegas, but um, it was pretty cool yeah. going in there. It was pretty wild. I mean, it was, I when you know, when we went there, when we got married, I was like, Casino was one of my favorite movies then, so it was very exciting. What year did you get married? Um, 2001. Okay, so yeah, Casino came out in 95. 95, yeah. Yeah. So. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm happy um, Scorsese is one of my favorite directors. and We're just happy I, all I'm, around. I'm excited really. that we're doing one of his movies. <laughs> and I'm excited it's Casino because I think this is not like what I think would be our direct go-to. You know, it's not so on the nose yeah. of doing like Taxi Driver or Goodfellas. Yeah, which though I love both of those movies, I do them in a heartbeat. But I'm glad we're taking some time to talk about Casino. I'm I'm gonna go on record now and say that I while I did see Casino when it originally came out, I did not commit it to memory, and I don't know why. And upon this multiple review, man, this movie rules. It's um, I mean, there there's a lot going on, um, but it's a fun watch. It's very entertaining. Even though it is a uh, uh, violent, violent watch. Yeah. It was uh, Tommy, <laughs> the little boy that lives in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> we should also say too, you might hear um, some extra collars jangling. We this is our first podcast where we have, um, we've had Mallory, Justin's dog, yeah. as a as a guest on the podcast before um but we also have my dogs here being stan and um we three dogs down here now three dogs but they're getting along so i think this is as soon as we say that they, everybody starts crying but <laughs> they seem to be getting along okay so i think this will be yeah. you're probably just gonna hear dogs every now and then from here on out on the mm. podcast yeah we we don't have like a doggy dungeon or, or you know some type of like puppy mill going on uh, the whining is just strictly they they just want our attention. Yep. Not going to get it right now. We're talking about Casino. So what are we going to talk about with Casino? Well, the fir- first thing for me is uh, this, this cast. This cast is so solid um, with um, Sharon Stone and Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci. Just to name the, the three top folks yeah. in this movie, This it is very strong and being a Scorsese film, um, it's gonna have to be. It's gonna have to have a, a strong cast. Yeah, talk about that. Love to talk about um, this movie was sort of an extension of Goodfellas in a way. Let's so talk a little bit about the placement of this movie in his career. Mm-hmm. A little bit about the behind the scenes production. A little bit about some of the themes, the tones. You yeah, know, there's a lot of comedy. This movie's got a lot of violence mixed with a lot of comedy which you would think that those don't work hand in hand as well because the violence is very realistic and brutal 
but I think this is a movie that I laugh a lot in. Yeah. It's very humorous. And I think it's meant to be. I don't think it's, you know, accidentally funny. Yeah, I can't wait to go more into that. We'll also talk about um, what what kind of a role music, uh, the costuming, and... Narration. Narration. Um, all these play strong roles in Casino, too. Well, we'll talk about Casino, and then after that... We have our picks of the week. So I decided to go with a De Niro film that came out one year after Casino, and that was 1996's uh, The Fan, which was directed by Tony Scott and co-starred Wesley Snipes. Yeah, I, um, I want to revisit this one. It's a fun movie. Yeah. Uh, I also kept with the love of Robert De Niro. Do you know he and I share a birthday? I did not know that. Yeah, I'm pretty proud wow. of that. Um, I kept with De Niro, but in more of a supporting role, which really doesn't happen that often, in 1987's uh, Brian De Palma movie, The Untouchables. I'm glad you went with that one. You were kind of on the fence. Yeah, yeah, I was on the fence. Yeah, it was. It it had been a little while. I think because it's more of a movie about the good guys. Yeah, you know, and like. Not that we're not talking about good guys or whatever in Casino. It's just um, when you when you compare it to Casino, it's kind of like Casino would beat up the Untouchables. Oh, yeah. For you sure. know? <laughs> well, we have uh, our picks of the week, and then we have a special guest back again, our good friend Justin Hayward. If I'm correct, he's mm-hmm. going to be talking a little bit about uh, Robert Richardson's cinematography in Casino, because this was the first movie that Scorsese used Robert Richardson. I think he had mostly been exclusively working with Oliver Stone. So Justin's going to talk about their collaboration a little bit. Cool. And something about the cinematography with Casino. So I'm excited to hear what he has for that. Yeah. And then, as always, we'll round everything out with our Murray moment. Yes, we will. So, um... Before we get into our first clip, Lindsay, as always, could you please tell us what Casino is about? All right. So based on a true story set out in Las Vegas about the legendary casino executive Sam Rothstein, who's played by Robert De Niro, um, and his uh, childhood mobster best friend when he was a kid, Joe Pesci, um, this movie is about money, greed, power, who's got it, and who's about to lose it. Throw an understandably self-centered, power-hungry Sharon Stone in as a love interest, throw her into the mix, and man, the story really explodes. This is a fun ride. There's a lot that happens in this and a lot of information that's thrown at you in the beginning, which I think is a great setup for what happens in this movie. It's a, it's a movie about the mob, but kind of uh, on a bigger scale than than what we've seen in previous Scorsese movies like Goodfellas. And a uh, really fast-paced movie. I mean, clock in at three hours, but it's the fastest three-hour movie that I've ever seen, I think. It sure is. I always have you in mind saying there's got to be a good reason if you're going to have me there longer than two hours. In Casino, there's a lot of information. I mean, most of the movies we do for episodes are pretty short so it was a uh, this was one i didn't quite get to watch it twice in one week yeah i only was i watched it like one and a half times yeah i do have to say that when i would sit down to watch this there were a few times that i turned off my phone i'm like i'm not getting interrupted this time i want to watch this the whole way through i totally understand that well thanks so much for that summary Lindsay. um we'll go into our first clip and then get into the discussion uh just wanted to say to you listeners um we usually this is a pretty clean show but we are doing casino, so you probably know what you're in store for. It's hard to find a clip without uh, a bunch of F-bombs in it, so if that's something that bothers you, you may want to turn the volume down for these clips. They had so much fucking money in there, you could build a house out of stacks of $100 bills. And the best part was that upstairs, the board of directors didn't know what the fuck was going on. I mean, to them, everything looked on the up and up, right? Wrong. The guys inside the counting room were all slipped in there to skim the joint dry. 
They do short counts, they lose fill slips, they'd even take cash right out of the drop boxes. And it was up to this guy right here, standing in front of about two million dollars, to skim the cash off the top without anybody getting wise, the IRS or anybody. Now notice how in the count room nobody ever seems to see anything. Somehow somebody's always looking the other way. Now look at these guys, they look busy, right? They're counting money, who wants to bother them? I mean, God forbid they should make a mistake and forget to steal. Meanwhile, you're in and you're out. Pass the jag off guard who gets an extra C note a week just to watch the door. I mean, it's routine. Business as usual. In, out, hello, goodbye, and that's all there is to it. Just another fat fuck walking out of the casino with a suitcase. So I guess the first thing um, that I like make mention of, because that clip is, is the narration of Joe Pesci explaining how a casino works and this movie really does it has some so much narration i mean probably more narration than most movies that i've seen and more than just I, one person and it really yeah more than one person and it drives the movie i mean a lot of this movie is essentially montage with a narration over the montage but the narration is so great this movie's kind of plotless i mean there is a story don't get me wrong and there is conflict there's conflict and everything but it's it's ultimately plotless so it's like there's a lot of this like narrative exposition that goes on because there are these intricacies on how a casino works and how politics fall into play in this town and how these guys follow these different codes of ethics and a lot of that is explained through narration and montage really well you know i mean and i think it's a very clean explained film but there is so much exposition and there is so much yeah information coming at you just at a rapid fire pace yeah i don't think that this movie is too complex to understand in one watch like you get what's going on in in just one watch but i think to really appreciate the different levels in which the story is happening and unfolding and to appreciate like the the humor a, a lot that comes through the narration and just the level to which the story goes, I think takes more than, more than one watch. Well, speaking of the humor, I, that was one, you know, one of the things we mentioned talking mm-hmm. about is cause this movie I think has a quite a bit of realistic violence. It does. They certainly made it graphic because this is based on a true story and, and the violence that does happen, these things like the the head and the vice scene did happen. Yes, he you did just hear that correctly. There is a head and a vice. It's, it's brutal and so, some of the stuff as I've gotten older <laughs> I find myself closing my eyes more in, in some of these scenes, especially the mm-hmm. the the scene where they're beating Joe Pesci and his brother with baseball bats. Yeah. Not to uh, ruin anything for you. And but and so it's it's wild that this movie is uh, so so highly peppered with humor. And I think that it really is a good dichotomy, mm-hmm. you know, mixed with the violence is to have humor in here because it, it kind of breaks up the tension because these are very I mean the the characters in this film are pretty scary. I mean Joe Pesci's character in this is terrifying. is very terrifying, but he's also very funny and I think a lot of times mm-hmm. all, like all these guys he's like wise guy uh mafia guys they're cutting up around each other and they're always going for humorous bits and a lot of it's like you know they're ripping on each other. Yeah. But it's a, it's a funny thing to watch and I think the way Joe Pesci talks about things is is real humorous even when he's doing his narration and talking about something as is is grim as digging holes in the desert to murder people <laughs> but he's you know it's it's funny the way he the way he delivers is saying well you know you got to pre-dig the hole you got to be smart about it because if someone comes along you know then you got to dig a couple, couple more, holes, more holes and then you know you're there all freaking night so it's <laughs> it, i think that there's a lot of humor you know it's i think it's purposely placed in there there's something to be said when you go to make a movie this violent, you have to get assume that you're going to turn off some people. Yeah, I mean, some people are just going to tap out. They're, they don't want to see a movie this violent, and I understand that. With with the humor and violence for this movie, I think one thing about the humor why I think it works so well is because it's almost like 
the humor that happens it's not like it's ha ha jokey time or anything like that it's it's kind of just like the humor that happens naturally that in in everyday life when you're talking to people or i mean it happens with me i think i am, am there's always some type of like comedic line running through my head uh, all the t- all the time and i feel like the humor that happens in this is more reality based it's kind of just like what what happens when you're talking about things and 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 sometimes when it's something really serious and i'm not saying like regularly talk about you know digging holes in the desert for right. graves or anything not regularly anyway but um you know like absurd situations sometimes lend themselves to throwing in an inappropriate joke i'm queen of that so to me the humor that happens is very natural in this versus like yeah jokes joke time with the violence too i don't feel like the violence that happens in this movie is glorified if anything i feel like you you watch it and you feel it with with some movies it'll either be like one over the top and just like like um okay um tarantino with like and I know that there was a purpose for this, but like blood squirting and like being kind of like ridiculous and over the top. There was a, there was a reason he did that. That was a stylistic choice. This feels like it is a brutal watch on on the violence tip because it was just brutal. Yeah, and, it no, was, I, and it was real. I couldn't happened. agree more. I think if it was glorified, it'd be easier to watch. It'd be yeah. easier to digest. Yeah. Another thing too, I would say, and I think I mentioned this to you before on the drug aspect of this movie. I don't feel like drugs and drinking are, I'm not saying that this was um, like a moralistic, you know, thing that Scorsese or, or Nick Pelleggi was like trying to do, but I don't feel like at any time drugs or drinking are glorified in this either. If anything, there it's it's showing. I I don't know how many times Sharon Stone's someone's like, hey, why don't you? You really need you really need another drink. You know, we're not going to like extreme close ups of somebody doing a line and it's like looks like kinda cool or something like that. It's more like the way it's portrayed in this is like kinda gross and like obviously that person is spiraling out of control and they're and they're headed towards something that's not good. I think I appreciate watching the realistic aspect of this movie and knowing that it was a true story yeah. for the most part. I think it's way more effective another f- kind of like fun visual comparison that they show is like with Sharon Stone's um I- increased drinking and just kind of like a dive into the pit that she goes into is paralleled with Robert De Niro doing shots of uh an acid like stomach reliever yeah. and an- an- acid um and i think that that's another that's another like it's saying everyone's stressed out and this these are the different right. ways that they're coping with it but it's also really funny to yeah well, put those that, against each other they take us on such a ride between what goes on behind the scenes of the casino what it takes to run it the stress the pressures and then also the pressures in the uh, what it takes to kind of uh be an opportunist you know like Joe Pesci being He's working for the mob. He yeah. sees the opportunity in Las Vegas to that it's wide open. Like he becomes the most feared guy in town. Yeah. Yes, and it, it just it it takes us on such a trip. Like seeing how that all goes down and seeing how these characters live, how they talk, how they dress. Everything is done um, with such precision and and care and. I feel th- this is one of those movies where it, we're watching based on a true story, but I don't feel like I'm seeing like a bio movie. I feel yeah, like you could true. you could have told me that this movie wasn't based on a true story and it wouldn't. I, there's no sense of this being a biopic whatsoever. Or yeah. I mean, it, 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 it feels like it's its own very hyperactive, crazy movie about this guy running a casino. Yeah. Yeah. This movie really is a wild ride. I would say that. Well, let's um let's go to another clip. Then we'll come back. We'll talk about. We really want to want to get into talking about the cast. Yeah. For this, so we'll go to a clip with uh, cause Sharon Stone. I think really uh, she's nominated for 
and ask her for this for a performance in Casino. Um, and I think she really plays a huge role in she's like center stage through the second half of this film. Yeah. So I'll go to a clip of her and De Niro and then we'll come back and talk about the cast. Alrighty. Come with me now. Come with me now. I want you out of here. I want you out of here. I want you out of here. Take your fucking pay and get out of here. I'm going. I want my money right now. Don't get your money. Don't worry. The arrangement is over. No kidding. No kidding. And I still get my money. I need some cash okay. right now. You can't just put me I'll in the street. Cash. You know, you haven't been straight with me ever since I met you. You never even loved me in the first place. I need eyes in the back of my love fucking you. head. You're your fucking bitch. I love you. I mean, I love you. Treat me like I'm your fucking dog. You're lower than a dog. Fuck you. Yeah. So, um, a lot of talk about with the cast here, so we'll try to do this as briefly as we can because we want to get a lot in. Yeah. First, I don't know. This is the thing. I think the Joe Pesci character, Mm -hmm. a lot of people will say, well, he's essentially just doing what he did in Goodfellas. And it's like, he is in a way, but there are a lot of things in this movie that Joe Pesci does. It's like a bigger scope and it's a deeper uh, range of a character. Yeah. Like, I think there's a lot of layers that Joe Pesci adds in this film to this character that wasn't in Goodfellas. I think and he's I, much scarier. He's much scarier, but I think also he's much more compassionate. Yeah. He, he does, he does fly off the handle and he does do crazy things, but he also is, is much smarter. I think, you know, he thinks about all the elements of like how not to get in trouble. He's not, yes. he's not so much worried about consequences coming to him from something that he does of somebody else. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? He is always ready to battle it. You know, he's always ready to face any consequence, which does make him scarier. Yeah. What's it? What's his one line when he's threatening the banker is like, uh, it's like, I don't care about jail. Cause I'm stupid like that. <laughs> and that's my business. That's, that's my business. <laughs> oh yeah. You're terrifying. Yeah. I, I would say, I mean, I, I love Goodfellas. But this movie is kind of grander than Goodfellas. Um, I like it a, a little bit more. Than I do that. too, and it, I used to be the opposite. But this one, yeah, I do love it a little bit more. I think that the the characters are more intricate. I think that the world is more yeah. unique. You know, I think it's like a it's a it's a beautiful, beautifully made film. Like it's gorgeous looking. I like I I also kind of like the male characters more in Casino, even though some of them are a little even Joe Pesci scarier. Um, I like them a little bit more than in Goodfellas. I feel like you're getting so much more story. You're getting so much more of a bigger piece of a you know. And maybe that is it. The, the, there's more opportunity to explore these characters yeah. in, in Casino than Goodfellas. That's. Yeah, and right. the big part with Casino to me is the introduction of, uh, you know, the female characters in Goodfellas are are pretty minimal. You yes. know, they're they're secondary a lot, and there's a strong female character in, in Casino played perfectly by Sharon Stone. Yeah, I mean, she's just a powerhouse in this movie, and just this really raw, crazy performance that she gives is uh, it's it's just so vicious in. <laughs> And nuts. And I mean, really, like the last 20 minutes is, I feel like, and I probably have used this movie before, but like her performance is like, is good. And if not more unique and crazy than Gina Rollins and Woman Under the Influence, Mm. which is really like a a high watermark for me for that going out there, just like really letting go. And you're screaming and you're yelling, but. But it's not this overplayed thing. It's not this over the top performance. It's it's this. Uh, you're really seeing somebody go through the ringer, and you're yeah. like right there with them. Yeah. And like you almost feel exhausted when you're done watching. You're just like, oh my gosh, this is just an. Ex- it's 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 enthralling, but it's exhausting. Like I feel like my heart rate go down. Yeah. After <laughs> she calms down in this movie. I think that's partially, I feel like, because we we see her start out at such a high point and so proud and confident and seemingly independent um, and, and a really good spot for her. I, I mean, I guess she's she's going through life on her own independently for the most part. But we see her kind of like 
rise and then just kind of like plateau and she kind of doesn't realize how good she has it and get too greedy and then just this automatic decline. She just has an opportunity with this character to show such a range of emotion and evolution of a character that not everybody would be able to um, really pull this character out and Sharon Stone was um, an excellent choice for that. She was I think she won a Golden Globe for this. She was nominated for a lot of things but I think only won a Golden Globe but yeah, very well deserved and you know and in movies before and after Casino the, that she's done, maybe they haven't been the greatest movies, but I can say, too, that there hasn't been a movie that's, like, been bad because of Sharon Stone. No, like she's a, She's a solid um, actor, and Casino really gave her an opportunity to showcase that. And I, and I think what really is on display, the Joe Pesci, Robert De Niro, and Sharon Stone evoke in this movie could have not really come across as well if you had different actors is Mm -hmm. this real desire to have control and i feel like you have these three characters that are coinciding with each other that interacting with each other constantly and they all want a maximum amount of control over their life and over the situation and they're hungry and they're dominant and they're they have big personalities and they clash and i think it takes a lot of stamina and energy to bring that performance out and I think all three of them did such a great job and De Niro specifically I mean I think De Niro is always really great but I think he really does like an understated performance in this where he is calm he doesn't explode like he does in a lot of movies he does explode a little bit in this movie but I think like he stays reserved and he listens yeah and watching him listen you see him figuring out how to control the situation, but the reactions that he gives of him, like listening to another (laughs) character explain themselves is so great. Yeah. There's so many times I feel like I'm waiting for Robert De Niro to blow up like what you just said. And, And it is totally true. Just knowing other movies that he's been in and you know, what kind of character sometimes he, he typically plays in Martin Scorsese films, but really it's kind of, one thing that makes me love his character even more is his composure and that he doesn't explode. And it's, it is the opposite of, of what you expect. He does a really good job in this of like displaying that anxiety. Like when he's watching the news and he's, they're talking about the trial coming up with him and his possibly not having his license, his, uh, gaming license, he just looks so like the world is about to crush him, but he's in when we see him by himself, like when he's with everybody else, when anyone's around him, he's, he looks ultimately confident, but those quick little scenes where we see him by himself in his room, watching the television, doing shots you, you of see, uh, you, antacid. Yeah. You <laughs> see the look on his face. Like he just looks like the weight is pushing down on him. Yeah. And I think that the, I don't know, to me, that's always, uh, interesting and i think it always makes for a good pr- performance is like when we we can see a character how they act by themselves and how they are when they're around other people because i think that's a big part of how real life works you know we when we're around people we have a certain particular way you know i don't think anybody acts exactly how they are around people how they are by themselves you know maybe but i feel like there I is don't. that there's that difference you know like when you're by yourself and you're comfortable and you know, you're thinking about things or you're, yeah, you know, there, there's a different layer. You can let go a little bit. And I think Robert De Niro is plays that in all his movies. He plays, he sees that dividing line between how he is when he's alone, how he is when he's around other characters. Yeah. Also with Joe Pesci, you kind of would expect based on other things that he's done in his career too, for him to explode too and just be like out of control, out of hand. What is cool about this part is that even though he is kind of psycho and a total murderer, he's very composed while he's doing it. And he might be yelling, but he's very much in control. You never feel like he's, uh, he's completely, completely lost it. He's, 
very much maintaining control and I think that's what makes him scarier. Yeah, and I also think he adds enough humanity into his character that because he's a ruthless killer. Yeah. And he adds enough <laughs> like humor, he's charming and enough humanity in his character where it's like even when he's you know, he's done so many we've seen witness him do so many terrible things and say so many terrible things, but I still feel some sympathy for him when he's like getting when he when he's getting murdered. Yeah. Spoiler. He yeah. does get murdered. He does get murdered. Oh, one other honorable mention. Man, and he's really great in it. But James Woods, I just want to punch him straight in the face in this movie. His character sucks. He he really does the way but he he's looks really good at it. acts. I mean, he <laughs> it's just like if it just he really tapped into the essence of like what a real scumbag slime ball is just such a scumbag <laughs> and some other honorable James, mentions james woods plays the plays this guy that is not really sharon stone's like ex-boyfriend or boyfriend he's he's someone that's um has a power over her yeah, that's yeah. getting her again to making money playing with control and yeah. so manipulative again everybody's yeah. manipulating everybody but he takes the cake in this he sucks just so terrible and uh couple other honorable mentions frank vincent who along with de niro and pesci was in together with them in raging bull and, uh -huh. and also in goodfellas um was really great in this and i think he's such a natural um and worked with joe pesci for years i mean they came up singing together as lounge singers and doing comedy and yeah. you can tell when they're on screen together i mean they're just it, same thing he's with, on the sopranos same thing for with, years too. same thing with pesci and de niro i mean when they're on screen together, they're just they're so comfortable. It's just it, it's crazy. Their their chemistry is just insane. And I know on this, I heard that they did tons and tons of improvisation. A lot of the montages and um, narration. narration was like very very structured. But when it was just Joe Pesci and De Niro with their scenes where they're acting out like. Like you were telling me, they had to start and a finish, but just, they just like going like a lot. Most of the scenes with them together was improvised. I read that there was a little bit of that on Raging Bull and then a little bit more on Goodfellas. But at this point, they had reached a moment in their careers and their acting relationships where they could just go and go and go and without without a script. And I, I think that's great because yeah. they're when they're together on this, it's just it's like lightning. It's crazy. Yeah, they're. They sell it. Their their friendship together and way the evolution of their friendship, um, from how we understand how it was to where it ends, I believe every second of it. And finally, uh with the cast, I just want another mention of Don Rickles. I think he's great in this. And the very tiny scene with Joe Bob Briggs. I think uh, he's yeah. really great in this. And all these other yeah. side characters, I, like a lot of the dealers and all these little side characters that they used, they used actual real dealers um, and people that worked in Vegas, which I think really lends to the authenticity of the movie. Yes. Um, you know, the cops that were in it, they used real cops. I think Scorsese always does that with bit parts. I think he's a director that really knows the importance of like, no matter even though if it's like a few lines they get someone that's like really authentic um the only other director that comes to mind right now are the coen brothers like mm -hmm. you know they'll have someone that has like five lines it's like a store clerk but it'll be like the most authentic store clerk you've ever seen <laughs> in a small town like ever <laughs> just like would you just find this guy working there you yes. know you just start rolling on him yeah they just they're really good at and same thing with scorsese just really good at it finding real people to to do those roles and, and basically just saying do what you do don't don't act, you know. Isn't there a, a store clerk in in Casino that also happens to be Scorsese's mom? I mean, in real life. Yeah, mom. yeah, yeah. And she was in uh, Goodfellas as well. <laughs> yeah. A couple of his movies. Yeah. <laughs> I love that she makes an appearance every now and then. Yeah, she's great in this too. Yeah, she is. Um. Well, let's. Um. So yeah, is there anything else we wanted to talk about before we move on to our picks of the week? Um. A good mention should uh, should be about the music and fashion of this. I mean, yeah, we can also save that for a final thought too. Yeah, we could. Well, we'll we'll maybe we'll do one and then we'll do the last one for a final thought. Okay. So for music, definitely music plays a huge role in this, and not necessarily a score, but like 
you know, big hits of the time period, uh, which Scorsese always has been big on, you know, using these musical cues that, that kick off a montage or that yeah. kick off a scene. He said he has like dat tapes of just um, like anywhere from like 10 to 30 songs from a particular era, like on or like decade um, that he has that he'll go back and like listen to when yeah. he's when when he's making a movie and in making casino there there were some that would come up and it's like oh yeah of course this song would this song would be playing on the radio at the time you know when when this movie was um you know took place in the 70s yeah. and it's wild like i would say a lot of times when a song kicks off that describes what's happening into a scene of how like a character feels about another character or something yeah. like that that would normally be off putting to me but yeah. in this film, it doesn't bother me at all. No, it doesn't at all. I mean, there's everything from I I love the little there's like a a Fleetwood Mac part that's um um playing in the car when they when Pesci gets into De Niro's car. There's like some Roxy music. I think that that's one of the moments that you're talking about with um it's a uh, love is the drug. Yeah, and that that's one of those parts where yeah. they're talking about like what's happening in the scene i think yeah when i also like to the going into the 80s and using devos i can't get no satisfaction yeah, yeah. i think there's like two there's yeah. two devo songs yeah there are yeah, two devo songs it and uh their cover yeah um so there's the 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 soundtrack of this movie is a winner yeah for sure a lot of hot hits yeah hot hits well, we'll uh we'll come back to final thought. We'll talk about the costuming wardrobe in this, but um let's move on to our picks of the week. Um, my pick was Tony Scott's nineteen ninety six psychological thriller, The Fan, with De Niro and Wesley Snipes. And your pick was The Untouchables. The Untouchables, which mm -hmm. had uh Kevin Costner, De Niro, uh Sean Connery. Unfortunately, Andy Garcia. <laughs> Your hatred for Andy Garcia cracks it me up. It runs deep. <laughs> What's the root of that? Oh, man. I feel like he's just one of those people just like has always gotten by on his looks. Yeah, I mean, he's pretty dreamy looking. But I think that's the thing. It's like he's just, he's like a good looking guy who's like a mediocre actor that's got these <laughs> like really huge roles in like big movies. I mean, I don't mind The Untouchables. I think it's a fine film. Mm -hmm. um, but... I don't. I think that you could take Andy Garcia out of that movie, and it would be it would operate just as fine. <laughs> I don't think anybody would miss him. <laughs> oh, why don't you tell us about the Untouchables? Oh, I I made sure to stay light on any type of Andy Garcia talk. Um, so don't worry, Justin. Okay, I did feel inspired to keep with the true. Uh, mafioso crime era you know similar to casino but this time with the untouchables it f focuses more on like the quote-unquote good guys so brian de palma's 1987 movie uh stars kevin costner as elliot ness the real life federal agent in charge of enforcing 1930s prohibition he along with three other do-gooder law enforcer types uh were known at the time as the untouchables hence the movie title and these guys were you know these were real guys the group was set to take down the infamous Chicago crime lord and American gangster we all know as Al Capone for his many, many illegal actions. But they were trying to start with tax evasion and violating war the Wartime Prohibition Act. Casino's Robert De Niro, as we said, um, does assume the role of Al Capone appropriately. And sometimes it's hard to see where De Niro ends and Capone begins. But nevertheless, I think the man is believable from what i can tell and that's only having seen old footage of capone um and in documentaries and i think um de niro was pretty adamant about he wanted to gain some weight for this role and he was concerned about the way he looked if it, if it was really gonna you know fit for this role um so he really thought about it a lot too next to de niro sean connery is my favorite uh, he plays a seasoned beat cop um, as Costner's uh, Elliot Ness enlists him kind of as his mentor and sidekick while trying to take down the legendary Capone. The Untouchables is most certainly not Brian De Palma's most well-known film. I mean, the man's directed Carrie and Scarface. 
but he's known for mixing crime dramas with psychological undercurrents. And The Untouchables is more of a crime drama, but it does have some serious emotional pull towards the good guys. I do feel it necessary to say and just come clean with this that while Justin is not an Andy Garcia fan, I am not a Kevin Costner fan. Um, And I think that the reason he works, in my mind at least, in this role is because Elliot Ness was such a do-gooder. It seems really appropriate that Kevin Costner like plays this role really well. I get, I really get why moms love Kevin Costner. I'm just not a fan of the guy. There's more than a few movies I like with him in it, but you know, again, we could put somebody else in that. That's fine. Uh, taking place, like I said, during the 30s Prohibition era. This movie is really packed with action. It's not an action movie by any means. Um, There's a lot of emotional turmoil and just enough factual information to combat the plethora of cinematic embellishment, um, I think, that that was used to propel the story of this movie. So I would encourage you to seek out the the truth behind the story of Capone and um, the Untouchable crew. Like I said, Sean Connery is easily my favorite part of the movie. Across the board is pretty celebrated. If if you're if you look up reviews of this, uh, one of the best lines he has is, uh, "You want to get Capone? I'm not even gonna try to do his accent. You want to get Capone? Here's what you do. He pulls a knife. You pull a gun. He puts one of yours in the hospital. You send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way." Now, there are a few lines in this movie that cut to the core, especially in 2018, and this this line in particular um, can take on a slightly different meaning than it did in the 30s and in today's climate. And speaking of Chicago, The Untouchables is really filled with um, a ton of city atmosphere. Obviously, it takes place in the city, and smartly enough, it's also it also was filmed there. Um, most times in the exact area where the factual incident took place. Not every time, but most times. And if you've been to Chicago, it's easy to stumble across these historical places and pretty cool um, to see a depiction of how they looked in the 30s or how, you know, movies think that they looked in the 30s. The score for this movie is pretty remarkable, too. Um, It really is very good at heightening emotions and encouraging that. Um, it's grandiose and lavish whenever Capone's on screen, but can switch to scarily menacing in one beat. And Elliot Ness and the Untouchables crew are generally followed by this kind-hearted music, but sometimes ghostly, somber orchestral numbers, maybe letting us know early on that things aren't going to be all roses for these guys and definitely does not end that way in the movie. For any mobster-type movies to work, you definitely have to care about the characters. Like I said, it's not an action movie. It's more of a subtle, caring thriller um, about a group of good-hearted folks looking to take down a crime boss. Um, The Untouchables is closer to a Western and and tamer than what you're going to get with Casino. But I don't think it's like a wiener of a movie. I really like it. It's exciting. And just kind of waiting for this movie to be remade, really. Any any movie that uh, is about Al Capone, like, the world's most famous gangster I'm waiting right. to be remade. I am surprised there hasn't been like a Capone, you know, straightforward Netflix focused thing. Yeah. Series. That's not a documentary that I, that I know of. I don't think there's been like a real so. high budgeted, high profile film. I feel like that this is, this is like the movie that was like bigger budget movie yeah. about Al Capone. I think Untouchable is a perfectly fine movie. I think it's got some great performances and and I agree Sean Connery is my favorite part about Untouchables. Easily. You know, I think he just yeah. really and his demise in that film is is always heartbreaking to me. Oh, his death scene is really is is terrible. It's really it's gut wrenching. All right, Justin. I want to be reminded of the fan because I remember watching it when it was like on HBO a long time ago. Um, but I feel like it's something I would really like. So the fan came out in 1996. Tony Scott had really kind of made a name for himself by doing these very high octane kind of bro movies. You know, it's always like, you know, he did Top Gun, Days of Thunder, Beverly Hills Cop 2, pumped up action movies, you know, very, really stylized and I don't think that the fan was as loved when it came out 
1996, but I think it's one worth revisiting. It stars Robert De Niro, who plays Gil Renard, and he is an aging knife salesman. Not necessarily door-to-door salesman, but, you know, he's going in the business trying to renew accounts, and um, it's really sort of the 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 end of that salesman era and he's definitely not as hungry anymore he's kind of off his game so he's losing accounts and he's also not the most socially comfortable person to be around so he plays it you know he's kind of like socially awkward kind of aggressive as he gets more desperate in his life with trying to get sales he gets a little more aggressive with his clients which leads to sort of his demise Um, He has a young son, sort of a damaged marriage with his ex-wife, and his one main love, his release, is baseball. He loves baseball. He's obsessed with it. You know, you would consider him a fanatic. People that know the stats follow the players, and he is really obsessed with one particular player played by Wesley Snipes. He plays Bobby Rayburn, who has been signed for a $40 million contract. But like a lot of players, this happens. They get signed for this big contract. All this pressure's on them, and they start playing bad. Like clockwork, like you see this a lot of times with with fans. They call them fair-weather fans. They immediately start disliking a player. You know, they're all about him when he's winning, but they, they're not there to support him through his uh, losing streak. Well, Gil... Robert De Niro's character supports Bobby through his losing streak. He He's a true fan. He considers himself a true fan. And his support goes a little bit terrifying. His job is going down in flames, so he makes it his mission to help Bobby Rayburn get back in uh, action. And he feels Bobby's main problem is, is there's another young up-and-coming player played by Benicio Del Toro that is the problem. So De Niro works his way into Bobby Rayburn's life, eventually killing Benicio Del Toro's character. And once that happens, Bobby Rayburn starts playing good again, and De Niro works his way weirdly into his life until it comes down to this sort of crazy, unbelievable showdown where fan becomes foe. Tony Scott can do these sort of just crazy, he goes into like hyper- unrealistic scenes in movies where you really have to suspend disbelief and, you know, just go along for the ride. What I like about this movie, as opposed to all of Tony Scott's films, is throughout the years, he's always done movies where the lead actor, usually always played by a male, is like this confident, powerful character who's like fearless and usually is always in control and this is one of the few movies i think that tony scott tackled that dealt with two fractured characters who are sort of in the downward spiral of their life and i think he really uses that um, to his advantage i I think these characters they they do take the time to be explored their emotions you know where they're at in their lives i will say the the thing about the fan and why it does feel kind of run of the mill, and I agree, it's it, it's you know there there's definitely as far as like thrillers go, psychological thrillers go, go there's a lot of things that you've seen a million times over. I, I think that this movie could have been an opportunity to explain fandom, you know, why people are obsessed with players, and it really never goes that route. It sort of, it I think it starts there and then immediately goes for the jugular, like the the psycho fan, the psycho like person that's going to start killing people but i think there's enough tension there's enough action going on that that that's fine it uh it works fine with what it's doing good performance from wesley snipes and de niro you know i can see when this came out we've seen de niro do this thing three or four times before but he's so good at it he's so good at what he does he's so good at making characters like this compelling and real squirmy. This is probably the most squirmy and uncomfortable I've been when watching one of uh, De Niro's performances. And uh, it really makes for a good time, especially the first 20 minutes. It really, you really get locked into the movie. Um, But I think if you're like me and you like, you're a completist, you like seeing the, the beginning, middle and end of a filmmaker's career. And Tony Scott did have a pretty successful and uh, amazing career. He put out quite a few films, uh, quite a few good films. Um, yeah, it's it's really it's 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 worth uh, taking a look if you've never seen it, or worth going back if you remember not liking it that well. Which is, I didn't remember liking it that well, so I was pleasantly surprised uh, going back into this one. I did uh, leave this out for you if you want to borrow it because I know you said you hadn't seen it since it came out, right? Oh yeah, I'm 
debating on if I'm going to watch that tonight or not. It's but, a good one. It's real entertaining. Yeah. it's It strikes me as a movie, and from what I can remember, just a movie that is meant to yeah that that whole 90s psychological thriller thing like i'm a fan of that even even bad ones this seems like very fun it lasts 30 minutes like there's really no surprises it's like you kind of know where it's going <laughs> you know what's but, gonna yeah, happen but the first 15 minutes is like i was real into it like real into yeah. the character i also get sucked into a baseball movie too or anything to do with baseball yeah so. it's clear from this movie that tony scott has like never watched like a regular baseball <laughs> game it's just like <laughs> Is that right? There, well, there's like multiple movies where he's done like sports sequences yeah. where it's like raining so hard, like the <laughs> wind's blowing and like they would just call a game. But in like both this and Last Boy Scout, they're just like, continue <laughs> on. It's like, what? Wouldn't happen, yeah. dude. I was just seeing, I didn't realize Tony Scott did The Hunger. And that's my glaring omission. I should have realized that. But that's a weird, that's a weird vampire it's, movie it's that like I, his, like, I like. It's like his like only real arty film and then he was just like i'm just gonna do these big <laughs> yeah and then yeah. like right after that was top gun yeah, or something yeah, like, like the that. hunger to top gun <laughs> what a jump yeah well uh those are our picks of the week uh the fan and the untouchables next like we said we're gonna hear from our friend justin hayward filmmaker out of chicago He's going to be talking to us about uh, Robert Richardson's uh, collaboration with Martin Scorsese and Casino. So this is Justin Hayward. Hey folks, quick disclaimer. I had a bit of a bad cable that I didn't realize until I was done recording, so some of this might be a little staticky. Sorry about that, and try your best to ignore it. Thanks. Robert Richardson is one of my all-time favorite living cinematographers. If you don't know what a cinematographer is, and I suggest you listen to the last Don't Push Pause episode on the movie Fargo, where I go into much greater detail into the definition of a cinematographer than I will here. But a quick recap. A cinematographer is also called the director of photography because they direct everything to do with the photography in the movie in partnership with the overall director. But as I mentioned in the last episode, not all cinematographer and movie director's partnerships are the same. Some directors are very collaborative in all aspects of the camera work with their cinematographer and often let the cinematographer have a great deal of control in the way the movie is shot. I've read the relationship of Robert Richardson with the great film director Oliver Stone was much like that. Richardson and Stone came up together in the film industry with Richardson shooting Stone's third feature film and his first non-horror film, Salvador, which also happens to be my favorite Oliver Stone picture. The two of them went on to make 11 more movies together before apparently having some sort of falling out, but it quickly became clear that some of our most beloved film directors thought Oliver Stone had a pretty good taste in his choice of cinematographer because Richardson went on to shoot for the likes of Errol Morris, Barry Levinson, Mark Forrester, the mighty Quentin Tarantino, Robert De Niro in the director's chair, Robert Redford in the director's chair, Ben Affleck in the director's chair. P.S. You know a cinematographer is a hot ticket when famous actors taking their shot at directing hire them. Because the famous actor that's trying to be a director hires only the very best crew in the attempt at not making fools of themselves when they suddenly want to try their hat at directing. But keep that between you and me, and the desk, and the lamppost. Anyway, it's my opinion that the greatest director of them all to hire Mr. Richardson in the wake of Oliver Stone is the modern filmmaking master himself, Martin Scorsese. Which brings us to Casino. Casino is the first of many collaborations of Richardson and Scorsese, and Richardson tells a funny story about how their first conversations went about. Apparently, shortly after Richardson found out he was going to shoot Martin Scorsese's next big gangster picture, he began to draw up storyboards, which is something he often did for his former director, Oliver Stone. If you don't know, storyboards are drawings of the shots you are thinking of shooting on any given scene in a movie, kind of like a comic book version of the movie that will guide you when you're on set shooting. Some filmmakers love them, others don't. A simple list of shots called a hold for dramatic pause, a shot list, will often suffice. Some filmmakers don't want any preconceived notion as to how they're going to shoot a scene until they're on set with the actors and crew. I personally think that's insane, but to each their own. So Richardson drew up some storyboards for Casino, and when he felt he had something good enough to look at, he sent them to Mr. Scorsese to see what he thought. Turns out he didn't think much of the storyboards, because Richardson promptly received a phone call from the legendary director where he politely told Richardson he would not even look at his storyboards. He said he only comes up with the shots for his films, and his cinematographers handle the lighting. So there you have it. 
This is not the same collaboration Richardson was used to. This is a director with a very clear plan as to how his shots are composed and blocked, all the way down to the timing of the music he would use in post-production. That story fascinates me because the shot compositions, the blocking or staging of the actors and the camera movement all feel very much like a Scorsese picture. But the lighting doesn't look anything like a single movie in the director's filmography up to that point. It's very theatrical, clean, bright, even in the dark scenes, and vibrant. All things that make sense for a film shot 90% in a casino, but still nothing like anything Scorsese has done in the past. The lighting did, however, look a lot like the style of some of Richardson's later Oliver Stone collaborations like JFK, Natural Born Killers, or even the last collaboration, U-Turn. Because Oliver Stone movies tend to look like the style of the cinematographer he's using at the moment, in my opinion, I have to conclude that throughout the years Richardson developed a personal lighting style that's as noticeable as Scorsese's camera movement, also in my opinion. He often uses extreme bright backlights coupled with diffusion filters on the lens that create almost a glow around the actors he's lighting. The edges of their shoulders literally have a halation around them. It's a super cool look, but a look that is pretty much 180 degrees the opposite of what most people consider unnatural look. If you've listened to the past Fargo episode I mentioned, you'll know that I talk about how Roger Deakins took a natural style of lighting to the extreme in a scene that felt entirely lit by car lights. Casino is an interesting follow-up to the last episode, because Richardson goes the complete other direction in the lighting of this film. In Casino, Richardson lights the scenes in ways that not only feel unnatural, but literally would defy physics in the real world. Okay, so that brings us to the scene I want to discuss today. It's a scene when Joe Pesci's character has just been banned from every casino in town and he's meeting Robert De Niro's character at a small dive bar about 60 miles out of Las Vegas to discuss his options, of which De Niro tells him he has none. Okay, so the two of them are sitting at a small table in this dank, dark little dive bar in the middle of the day. There are no windows in this bar other than about a two-foot diameter circle window in the front door. That's the only place daylight is allowed to enter the bar. The rest are indoor practical lights like lamps or fluorescents. Well, that doesn't stop Mr. Richardson from getting some sunlight working inside the bar. As I also discussed in the last episode, there are all sorts of lights used to light movies. For the sake of simplicity, I categorize them into what I call movie lights. But I'm not going to do that here because the lights he used were very specific to this situation. From what I can tell in my experience with lighting sunlit scenarios, in this situation he use what they call a xenon. I have to qualify the fact that I don't know that he used a xenon for sure, as in my research I could not find specifically what lights he used in that scene, but I've used xenons a lot throughout my career and I'm familiar with their look, so just call it an educated guess. Anyway, a xenon is a very powerful beam of light that feels very much like sunlight when shined through a window inside a room. It creates a very hard shadow like sunlight, but more important, it's a very narrow beam that goes a long way without spreading out like a practical light. It's similar to a spotlight in that way, but the quality feels like sun when you're using it indoors. So in this scene, it appears Richardson shined a xenon through that tiny hole in the door that rakes hard light across the bar area, making it appear that sunlight is streaming through that little hole and lighting the bar. But he didn't stop there. He took a second xenon and shined it through that same hole onto the floor in the middle of the establishment. So now there are two distinct beams of, quote, sunlight shining through that two-foot window, one cutting hard to the right of frame and lighting the bar area, and the other pointing straight at the frame, lighting the floor. Then... He added a third xenon and pointed this one hard to the left of frame lighting the camera left wall of the room. Now there are three beams of sunlight apparently lighting this place. All of them pointed in wildly different directions. One pointed to the right hitting the bar, another in the middle hitting the floor, and another pointed all the way to the left hitting the wall. Were there supposed to be three suns in the world of this movie? No. But I'm guessing Richardson wasn't lighting the scene according to reality. I'm guessing he was lighting according to composition, mood, emotion, any number of reasons. But I don't have to guess that any of the reasons he lit a scene with three separate and distinct beams of sunlight had anything to do with naturalism. But who cares? It looks awesome. And that's one of many reasons I love lighting in movies. There are no hard and fast rules to any of it. It's like painting, in my opinion. Abstract, expressionism, impressionism, surrealism, it doesn't matter. Objectively, none of it is less beautiful or ugly, meaningful or pointless than the other, but in the eye of the beholder, it can be simply magical. So thank you so much for that, Justin. I think the addition of Robert Richardson's to Casino was just awesome. I mean, this is a gorgeous film. I just love the way it looks, and it's just such a uh, jump, I think, from the style and look of uh, Goodfellas to Casino. So I think it was good to go with a, a different cinematographer to get a different look so you don't feel like you're in the same world. Yeah, thank you, Justin, very much for bringing that perspective to us. All right, well, uh, we'll keep moving along here. Here's your Murray moment.
chicks dig me because I rarely wear underwear, and when I do, it's usually something unusual. I think I need a root canal. I'm sure I need a long, slow root canal. You're gonna come and shake my monkey tree again? Oh, what does that old queen know? She didn't even chill. Hey, this is so structured. Is this hand shot? The flowing robes, the grace, all striking. That was fun. You know, a lot of these Murray moments are the result of exhaustive investigations, whether it's simply just prior knowledge of something I learned once or in books about or involving Billy Murray, extensive internet research, and even a few times, I think I've told you this, Justin, I've called Getty Images to find out the story behind a photo of Billy at an event in 1982 or 3 or 87. It's a lot sometimes. Casino really led me down the rabbit hole because I knew there were connections, but was there a story behind any of these minor connections? Like, first of all, Billy and Sharon Stone were amazing together in a favorite movie of mine, Broken Flowers, and from what I can suss out, they worked really well well together. But is there a story there? Billy and De Niro did Mad Dog and Glory in 93, which was an offbeat original comedy, very worth talking about, and I think we're going to in a future podcast. But, like... What's to talk about? What's to talk about as far as a Murray moment? Okay, one one time, Billy accidentally broke De Niro's nose during a fight scene in the movie, but it's not like he meant to. Accidents happen on movies. De Niro also had his nose broken by Robin Williams once, so maybe the story's like, hey, De Niro, why does your nose have a hex on it? What's going on there? <laughs> Even apparently they're friends outside of movie making, which is awesome, but still not a Murray moment. And just because Billy and Marty Scorsese were once dining in a luncheon for Richard Pryor in 1991 doesn't necessarily mean there's a story there. But man, do I want to know what they were talking about. Maybe it was Mad Dog and Glory. I don't know. Sometimes it's just really hard to figure out. Even Joe Pesci. There's some history there with Billy. The the two are big old golf lovers, so it only makes sense they've gone golfing together more than a few times. There's plenty of photos of them goofing around, even one with Billy being used as a chair for the cigar-smoking Pesci. But, you know, I'm not out on that golf course. And even if there were some Murray moments or secrets spilled on the golf course, I've never gotten to be that caddy along for the ride. I don't know. So with all these tidbits in mind... Here's one tiny one involving a really popular movie that might surprise you. One cameo role that people often cite of of Billy's is his brief appearance in Zombieland. I swear like seven out of ten times if you bring up Billy in conversation, somebody's going to mention Zombieland. Well, maybe you didn't know, but Billy wasn't even originally considered for this role. In fact, it was Patrick Swayze who was the number one selection for this role, but sadly he had a decline due to being sick. Casino's Joe Pesci was next in line. Matthew McConaughey was another front runner. Mark Hamill, even Jean-Claude Van Damme, Justin. These are just to name a few. I know, if only it could have been Jean-Claude. But in the end, it was McConaughey that they went with, um, who signed on, but he had to pull out at the last moment, literally right before filming began. Desperate and racking his brain, Woody Harrelson, who was the star of Zombieland, thought about his old pal Billy from their Kingpin days and was like, why the hell not? He allegedly only had Billy's 800 number um, as a way to contact him. I kind of don't believe that, but I don't know. He, that was the only way he had to contact him, allegedly. So he called, left a message, and Billy called right back. Because Billy didn't have an email address, I love this dude so much sometimes, Um, his section of Zombieland had to be faxed to his nearest Kinko's. So Billy picked it up, made some minor changes, including that his character not be an actual zombie, but rather a very alive person dressed as a zombie to fool the real thing, and then he faxed it back. An agreement was made, and boom, after this back-and-forth faxing session, Billy was filming two days later. The rest is history, and people love that cameo role of his. Now, this role, no doubt, will follow Billy around until the day he turns into a real-life zombie himself. Pesci and everyone else who turned down this role, for whatever reason, ended up missing one of the most memorable scenes from this movie. And maybe 
if it had been somebody else other than Billy, it wouldn't have even been as memorable. Who knows? Then this merry moment jumped all around and threw information at you like it was inspired by a casino style storytelling or something. And it totally was. Even though you know there's a story behind a photo, sometimes it's near impossible to figure it out, even if there is a story at all. But good thing for us, there's a million little stories out there along the way to help us piece together this Murray puzzle. Zombie Lane was a movie I didn't like when I first saw it. And then um, it was like a year ago. Yeah. A buddy of mine loaned me Zombie Land. So I sat down and just watched Zombie Land and I enjoyed the hell out of it. Um, and that Bill Murray role in it is fantastic. I can see why people res- respond to that. I mean, I can see why people like the movie. It's not one, it's never going to be one that's a go to for me, but I will admittedly. I think I've gone on about the Green Mile. I I automatically recoil sometimes at movies people are like ravenous about. Like the same thing with Shaun of the Dead. It's like the only movie that my dad likes. And I'm like, I don't know, dad. I just, a billion people like that movie. But but I'm also being yeah. kind of a jerk when I do that. But, it's but just Ghostbusters. The, the, okay. The, <laughs> all right. The all right. super obscure that's, Ghostbusters movie is your favorite. That's enough. Um <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's just sometimes I like can't. But I'm thoroughly entertained by Zombieland. I don't like to admit it. Yeah. But yes, that part with Bill Murray. I think, you know, okay, here's what it is. This whole reason of doing the Murray moment, which was actually like your suggestion because you know that I love the dude. Yeah. I think I just have this inner resentment in some ways uh, i i'm very happy of for bill murray and the trajectory of his career and that he had a giant resurgence where he was even more popular than he ever was before i think i'm just a little i'm just a little salty because i've i've liked that guy since before i could speak you know so i'm just a little salty sometimes right, fair enough when people are like oh my god bill murray is like in zombie land you're like uh-huh yes he was in zombie land you're correct he's also in some other things too but it's cool yeah i'm i feel you i think i'm just being a jerk you gotta, and i you don't gotta, you gotta let go i gotta bit. let go i'm you sorry you can cut this out of the podcast no, okay. i'm really sorry you don't have to be sorry Super obscure Ghostbusters. <laughs> Bill Murray's been a really obscure artist his whole life. <laughs> Tell that damn zombie land movie <laughs> shot him into the into the made him a household name. Anyway, I enjoyed Zombie Land. I, I yes. get what you're saying. I I, yeah. I do like Zombie Land. I really do. I I enjoyed your Murray moment. It was it was <laughs> I, I understood the reason why he went went all over the place. Yeah, it, was it made been, sense. It was casino inspired. There was a lot. There are just so many things that I wish I, I wish I could just straight up call him and be like, dude, what happened when like you were having lunch, you know, with Marty Scorsese like thirty five years ago? Yeah. Do you remember that conversation? He'd be like, man, we were so high on cocaine. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I uh, I totally forgot Sharon Stone was in Broken Flowers. Yeah. Oh, I love that movie so much. Well, thanks so much again for that Murray moment. Of course. So that pretty much wraps up another episode. I know final thoughts. We were going to, our second. Oh, yeah. We're going to go back to this, the wardrobe in Casino. Final thought on Casino. They spent a million dollars just on the outfits. A fun fact is because they designed the outfit specifically for De Niro and Sharon Stone, so they let them keep all those. Why outfits. not Pesci? He had some. Sh- they probably did, but as far as the research, I sure, found sure, this, sure. But, okay. Um, but Sharon Stone said one of the dresses that she wore that had metal on it weighed like thirty-five pounds. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Um, but the but I really do think that the the costumes in the movie, I love the way. De Niro's starts out like real slick, you know, and he's wearing mm-hmm. like gray suits and ties. And then eventually when it gets to the excess of the eighties, he's wearing like pink jacket, pink shirt, pink tie, pink pants. It's intense. <laughs> you know? Yeah. The costuming is, is 
very important, I, I think, as a character by itself in this movie because it really does, um, it acts as, you know, their kind of um, shield to to the world and what they come off as their their confidence like always like dressed to the nines and you know immediately looking at whether it's De Niro Pesci or or Sharon Stone like you can't mess with them you're not getting past them they're they're very confident in what they're 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 going to walk over you with great ease and you can tell that just by what they're wearing. Yeah, it's very like st- a status symbol. Yeah, like a very you know, it's it's a d- definitive way to say you know this is the lifestyle I live. You know, it's like I'm wearing two thousand dollar suits and a five thousand dollar watch. You know, very <laughs> way to let people know like what kind of person you are. Yeah, this is the way. I, this is the way I roll. And like you said, with uh, you know, you see how uh, the James Woods character. Ugh. Is the opposite. Well, the way in his, yeah. he's wearing cheap suits, and De Niro kind of says when Sharon Stone blows a bunch <laughs> of money on him, De Niro's like questioning her, and he's just like, well, "Even if he were to buy a nice watch, spend two hundred thousand dollars for him, which he wouldn't, because <laughs> he doesn't know what a nice watch he doesn't looks know what like." That is. Yeah. You know? Um, there's so, one thing I I heard someone that that worked on the movie say that uh about the progression as far as like sharon stone's character that as far as her clothes go um when she does start like really getting like going downhill and like drinking a lot and doing a lot of blow and just not functioning very well that you see that her her outfits begin to like not be as tailored or maybe it looks like she's she's worn them for a couple days in a row and like the butt's really saggy and like one outfit where she's really lost her mind and verbally attacking De Niro on the front lawn. Just, um, the, the clothes tell the story right, right along with, uh, the narrative too. Yeah. I think even like, uh, in that same vein, uh, De Niro, when he's sitting in his office, he doesn't have his pants on <laughs> cause he doesn't want to get them creased. So when he's got the meeting and the guy's coming in, he like, before he lets the person in, he like puts on his pants, you know I mean? Cause they always, doesn't yeah. want to ruin the crease in his pants. They got to look sharp for yeah. a meeting. So it just says a lot. Yeah. The costumes really play, I think like a big part in, in helping show where the characters are in the movie. Just um, fun additional thing yeah, to watch for. Yeah. Well, um, thanks so much again for listening. I uh, hope you enjoyed Casino. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite movies and, you know, it's been fun to kind of talk with you, Lindsay, off the mic about this movie a lot. It's yeah, I really love watching this. And just um, did you let me borrow the copy that I have or did you give me that because you have the Blu-ray? I gave it to you because I have the Blu-ray. Because I'm pretty stoked to own that now because it's really good. I'm Yeah, thank you for that. Hey, no problem. As much as you... You make fun of me for Blu-rays. You've re- they've really... Uh, <laughs> I reap the benefits. You've really been reaping the benefits of these <laughs> these DVDs. What did you give me tonight? Jeez. It's Alive. It's Alive. This uh, is Spinal Tap. And Starman. Starman. Come on, Justin. <sighs> what am I going to do with the DVD and the Blu-ray? Because the Blu-rays play down here, too. Nothing. I've only given you one Blu-ray. Yeah. Crimes of Passion. What a Blu-ray that was, though. <laughs> what a Blu-ray that was. Oh man, well, one day. So, uh, next episode, we are going to um, bring it back to a much Col- more culty, yeah. funny, strange film, and that's uh, 1988's Heather's, which uh, I'm excited to do. Yeah. I think that was one we kind of talked about doing, and we were like worried about it. Kind of, you know, there's always been a controversy, I think, with Heather's recently in the last three or four years it always makes a top 10 list of movies that don't play now to like modern <laughs> audiences because it's comes off as offensive and i'm sure that'll be a topic of discussion yeah we have. of course it will um so we're gonna do heathers coming up next episode if you have uh, been listening this whole time thank you so much if you're new we appreciate you jumping on board you can always find us on social media don't push pause podcast on instagram don't push pause podcast on facebook or you can go directly to our website don't push pause podcast.com and if you want to contact us directly for any reason whatsoever, don't push pause podcast at gmail.com. Um, but until next time, I'm Justin Johnson. And I'm Lindsay Reaper. Thanks for listening.